Good morning. A very warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming out in the rain. It's so dismal today. Thank you for coming to this debate. Perhaps hands up who's come to the debate. This is a trilogy. Who's been here before? It's the last one. The good students. Oh, okay. So some. And some, this is the first time in this trilogy debate. Now, we're here today. It's hosted by the EWEA, as you know. And it's debate entitled, Turning the EU's 2030 Targets into a Stable Framework. Now, firstly, thank you. It's not just your ears that I need today. It really is your brains. There are some very clever people up here, but we really like you to talk. We don't have a lot of time, but we really, really want to hear from you. Now, as you probably know, as I said, this is the third in the series. We had the debate on the uh, fossil fuel subsidies. We then looked at how to get more renewables online. And now we're looking at the targets. Now, bear in mind that we're not really just here to discuss the kind of pros and cons, the joys and disappointments of the targets themselves. The clue of the orientation of today's debate really is in the title, and it's all about the words stable framework. So the targets are set. It really is all about where do you go from here? What's the role of the EU going forward in terms of implementation? What's the role of the Parliament? What's the role of the member states? I mean, you could declare that Europe's energy union should become the world number one in renewable energies. The question is, does this package allow for that? And of course, when is the Parliament? Where is Mr. Parliament here? When is the Parliament going to have its say? And the role of member states will have a look at that too. After all, it's binding at EU level, it's not binding at national level. So, how do we get everybody the carrot approach, the stick approach, to deliver collectively on the targets? How can implementation be achieved in the most cost effective and efficient way? It's a lot to cover. I think I've given you some ideas about where we'd like questions, what we're going to be looking at today. We don't have a lot of time. In the schedule, basically, after this little warm-up, I will ask each of these fine gentlemen to make a two- to three-minute statement, something that will dazzle you, hopefully. I mean, that's the idea. Shout, sing, whatever you like, but they will hopefully dazzle you with their first intro. And then we've got a gentleman here at the very end who's going to comment on that. We're going to find out all about you in just a moment. So, for your delectation, we have, first of all, on my left, Killian Gross. Now, there was supposed to be Mechtilt here, as you know, but at the last minute, she had more important things to do, like going to shop for shoes. I don't know. I think something more important for that. So, we have Killian Gross here, Acting Head of Unit, Coordination Energy Policy Director at General for Energy, European Commission. Thank you very much. Could we give a warm welcome to this gentleman, please? On his left, we have Frederick Federley, MEP, Committee of Industry, Research and Energy, Group of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe in the European Parliament. Another, come on, exercise those arm muscles. Okay. Yeah, big one. <laughs> Get up, stamp your feet. Jazz hands, if you like, quite like jazz hands. On the left, we have Guy Lentz, Coordinator for EU and International Energy Affairs, Permanent Representation of Luxembourg to the European Union. And of course, Luxembourg will hold the EU presidency in the second half of 2015. Also gives you a clue as to some of the questions that we might wish to ask him today. On his left, we have Hans Ten Berg, Secretary General, the Union of the Electricity Industry, Euroelectric. And we have Thomas Becker, CEO of the European Wind Energy Association. And finally, yes, don't worry, I see the gentleman there who is studiously studying his pencil. There is a sixth man sitting here, and it's Maciej Kolacek. Now, Maciej is first councillor at the permanent representation of Poland to the EU, and your role at the outset is kind of a little bit different. You're going to listen to what these guys say and give us first reactions, and then I think just give us a little bit of Poland's vision of how things should be taken forward, what you think about that. Give us a, a kind of a, a, a quick insight in a fantastically concise three minutes. So, after their dazzling intros, really, we do want to hear from you, okay? Um, this is the time. Sharpen your brains, sharpen your pencils, ask your, ask your questions, grill these people, throw rotten tomatoes, stamp your feet, sing, I don't mind. I have two things to ask of you. First is keep it short and to the point. We don't have a lot of time and really, really clear. And the second thing is for both these guys on the panel and for you, if I have to interrupt and stop you and do things or wind up things or, okay, we're really bored things, forgive me, it's my job. This is the big watch. We have to come in on time, okay? I really appreciate you've all skipped out of work to be here, but you've got to get back to work and I've got to get you there on time, all right? So I think that's it. Is that clear for everybody? Any questions? Do we all know where we're at? Good. So, first person in the hot seat, on my left, Killian Gross. Could you make your fantastically dazzling statement to these good people? You have two or three minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
First, of course, I have to clarify that Mechthild is working on 2030 and not on buying shoes because we're all far too busy because 2030 is, um, is urgent and important and we are all trying to get it up and running as soon as possible. We think from the Commission that the 2030 is a big success and especially in the framework of this event because 2030 already provides for a lot of certainty and security for the future because I think it's not self-evident that 28 uh, heads of state have uh, agreed on climate change uh, targets for 2030. This was not clear from the outset. And we now have a strong commitment on, um, on three targets, 40% CO2 reductions, 27% renewables on an EU uh, level, binding target, and 27% energy efficiency with a review clause by 2020 with a view of perhaps increasing it to 30%. This is a very strong message which will allow uh, the EU to negotiate strongly in Paris next year at the Conference of the Parties on the International Climate Change Convention. Uh, in addition to that, which should not be forgotten, we have two uh, objectives on interconnection. We want to achieve 10% of interconnection by 2020 and 15% of interconnection by 2030 in relation to the national generation capacity. This is important in this context because, um, in particular uh, for renewables, interconnection plays a key role in order to have an internal market and to be able to use renewables where they're best placed. So I think this is really in line, the interconnection is in line with the energy security target, but as well very important for the renewables target. In the Council conclusions, we have already a lot on implementation, in particular with regard to the CO2 reduction target, because we have precise figures for the ETS sector, for the non-ETS sector. We have statements on the increase of the linear <coughs> reduction factor, uh, Several funds are mentioned, we will come back to that later, I guess. So uh, the market stability reserve is mentioned. So on ETS and CO2 emissions, we have a lot. In addition, uh, the Council has expressed its support for a new governance structure, which I think is key, uh, in particular to the non-ETS sector, but as well for the renewables target and the energy efficiency target and the interconnectors. Because this governance structure will allow us to, uh, to create a new format of cooperation between the Commission and the Member State, which should ensure, as the Council has said, on the one hand side, flexibility for the Member States, on the other side, compliance with the targets. So we want to have both. We want to use a new model for this, which should allow us to reach this and to leave Member States the necessary flexibility and to improve by doing that regional cooperation between the Member States so that nobody just al develops this plan alone, but yet we get more and more to an integrated European approach where the different national plans match with each other. So I think, and last but not least, we have agreed on indicators which should uh, monitor the economic performance of the transition. So where we would look at price differentials with the third countries, for instance, or uh, diversification of supply routes. So we will regularly, the Commission will regularly monitor uh, the process in order to make sure that this is done in an economically viable way. So I think we have a lot of concrete elements how we want to implement this framework. And therefore, I think the framework will certainly provide for investment certainty. Okay. So I think that's a very clear there. Uh, what has raised eyebrows in the front, I think. Oh. Very clear there. I think the EU is happy. And the EU is happy. And you have specifically picked up on some specifics there, including governance structure. You think there's lots of implementation measures. You've looked at the interconnection between the member states. Let's see what some of you think a little bit later. So I am passing directly on to Frederick Federley, MEP. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I was here on a, uh, an event just a few weeks ago, and usually when I speak, Roger Helmer uh, from UKIP is in the audience, and that gives a, uh, a, a clear picture of how the debate <laughs> will go in the House, because he is on the one side, and I'm uh, obviously totally opposite to him. So we'll have uh, quite many debates on this topic for uh, quite some time. Uh, I, I would start by saying that uh, there are a few things that are uh, extra vital for the discussion for the forthcoming years. Uh, I would say that one of them is having facts on the table because there are so many rumors and so many beliefs uh, that you could all, almost go to the fairy tales to, to get uh, descriptions that are uh, just as true as when it comes to energy. Uh, energy policies. Uh, just this morning I actually got a wind energy production level uh, from Sweden in 2011 because the debate is now going what will happen where uh, probably a few of the nuclear plants will be taken out of uh, order due to old age 
Yeah, so uh, quite many are afraid that the wind uh, production, which is now growing uh, rapidly in Sweden, will not be able to uh, provide uh, enough uh, energy. Uh, the figures are very good. Uh, we are lowering at the moment uh, the energy prices quite heavily. They've been reduced by half the cost per kilowatt uh, uh, for both for businesses and for for. Uh, for private persons uh, due to uh, massive investments in uh, wind industry. Uh, there's also a big debate on bioenergy, uh, on how it will work and how you see on uh, you the usage of forest. Uh, we will also have, in addition to uh, these uh, 2030 targets, we will have a discussion on, on uh, forest policy within the uh, within the house uh, the forthcoming months which have, has a great impact on the possibility to actually work on renewables uh, we are trying to use a good of uh, a lot of good examples from how we have been working in sweden we started the transition like 30 40 years ago uh, to more of district heating uh, using a lot of the green gold we have in sweden and for all these years we've been changing towards more of renewables, we now have more than 50% renewables in our energy mix. Um, uh, we have actually uh, been getting more and more forest for every year in Sweden. We've never had as much forest as we have at the moment. We've never used as much forest as we do at the moment. This is uh, the one renewable source except wind that will never uh, disappear from our hands if we use it sustainably. Uh, the biggest uh, target is to actually provide uh, a game set of rules for industry. So they will know what investments to do in the forthcoming years. The big thing now is to get the ETS working. Uh, it, it has been, uh, the, the, the emission um, allowances are too cheap today. We're actually at the moment fooling our industries, telling them that this is uh, the, the, the price will be on sale for quite some time. Mm -hmm. There are strong forces within the house. We had the first reading yesterday in the uh, uh, first round of uh, opinions yesterday in the ITRA committee. And we can see that the EPP, uh, for their part, wants to do anything to keep the prices down. But that means that when, uh, if you don't go hard on the MSR at the moment, the, the price stability mechanism, that will mean that when it comes into full effect in 2021, it will be a hard blow on the industries. If we now can try to get the MSR in, uh, in place quite soon, 27, uh, 2017 or 2018, it will mean that the business will know how to make the investments for the forthcoming years. It will also take away the discussion that we it will inevitably come uh, in, in the forthcoming years when we get closer to 2021, when industry says, well, now the prices uh, for the emissions will go so high, so we need to take the, the, the ETS away uh, in total. Uh, so I would say these are the main topics that we need to deal with, uh, playing uh, game rules for the industry so they know what to do, uh, also having a debate with uh, more facts and, and also a big debate on what renewables actually is and what they can provide for us to achieve the targets. Okay, all right. Hope you've been scribbling. You see, he's given you clear indications of where you can ask questions and make fabulous comments. So, Right, on his left, thank you very much for that, Frederick. Now we move to Guy Lentz, coordinator for EU and International Energy Affairs. The next couple of minutes are yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, just a, a couple of things on... Um, first of all, about the 2030 target, I, I don't want to... to come back too much on that, but it's, it's well known that Luxembourg was uh, uh, probably with Denmark the two countries that were the most ambitious in terms of energy efficiency and renewable. So in that context, for us, European Council uh, conclusion, we're disappointing uh, by defining um, the 27% targets. Uh, but frankly, for us, looking to the future, uh, we know that the new commission and especially the new president of the Commission uh, has clearly defined much more ambitious target um, in energy efficiency and renewable than the one of the mm. European Council, and that is what counts for us okay. for, for the future. First point. Um, but I could imagine that in the area of AWEA, you, you have been also quite disappointed by, by the result of this European Council in terms of renewable target. But again, my message, don't be that, that pessimistic. There is a long way to go with this new Commission. On, on that on that targets um, now to come back on, on what was uh, also said and, and, and about the absence of, of national binding target that that were legally binding targets again here I, I would say two things first of all to take the good things of it the good side of it um, the renewable target the 27 percent 
target is a political binding target. And to me, that means something in Brussels. I will come back on, 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 on this when I will talk about governance, which is my main message uh, today. Uh, but secondly, that could surprise some of you uh, about what is the legally binding targets in the 2020 package. Uh, it is, of course, by being a legally binding target, a target that any country has to achieve, right? But there is also a point that I would s uh, stress here. By putting national binding targets on renewable as a precondition to work with your neighbors and to open cooperation and regional cooperation, um, I, could, I could imagine that we, we, by achieving the 2020 targets that we have to achieve, we may, by this precondition of achieving in our own country the target, we may have chosen not the most cost-efficient way to achieve it. So I, I wouldn't stress that much that the national mm -hmm. uh, binding targets are, are really the one that we still have to have. And I'm very happy that with the Commission, we are already opening the idea of, co of regional cooperation for today uh, achieving the 2020 okay. targets. Uh, but my, my most ah. important message, if oh, I may. Okay. No, that's yes. really the most important. Yes. It Go is on. about, you, you have talked about the framework. Mm -hmm. That's the most important. Now, what to do um, uh, from today about the, about the governance? Um, when you don't have nationally legally binding targets, you have to have a strong governance. And the, the, the Luxembourg position on that is quite clear. We would like from 2016 to have national uh, plans of energy, be annual plans that would define and streamline energy efficiency, renewable, interconnection, and security uh, policy and targets, uh, exactly on the same way we have it for national plans of reform, mm -hmm. that by the way were also launched during the 2005 Luxembourg presidency, mm -hmm. exactly the same way we have the European semester for social and economic issues, that we would have the same dialogue based on national plans between countries and commission and parliament to discuss about how to achieve these targets. It is about to have a new governance um, starting for 2016, by defining from 2016 to 2020 how to achieve the 2020 targets, and after that, from 2020, how to achieve and how to define national targets from the European targets in terms of energy efficiency, renewable interconnection, and energy security. Okay. All right, I'll stop you there. Um, you're very clear. Thank you very much. I could see Thomas nodding. First of all, you said you must be disappointed, and there was a, like a big nod. You were aiming it at me, but he's actually the CEO of EWE, so he <laughs> was nodding there. Um, so I don't know. What do you think about that? Is it really so dramatic that there's nothing binding at national level, and it's more you think it could be actually an advantage to better cooperation? Where do you stand on this? So I am moving directly to uh, Guy's left, to the gentleman Hans Tenberger, Secretary General, Union of Electricity Industry, Euroelectric. And your three minutes starts now, monsieur. Thank you. Uh, looking at the targets, we read them quite different. We think that we have a CO2 target in the electricity of industry of 43%. We think that we have a renewable target in the order of magnitude of 45 to 47% to achieve this 43%. Mm -hmm. We think that the efficiency target will go in the direction of 30. We call it ambitious targets. Going in that direction is not done overnight. Going in a decreasing market with efficiency targets, which will decrease the volume, and expanding in the same time the renewables to 45% is sailing against the wind. And I think this is the challenge which we have, and this is a challenge which I'm looking forward to. We will, will we sail in this direction? I think much has been said already by the parliamentarian. That determines how firm the parliament will be on the CO2 issue. If you give us a free ride till 2026 mm -hmm. by just using the existing CO2 rights, I can tell you that's the way to blow the investment climate completely. Yeah. Yeah. And I doubt very much if the Parliament is convincing enough to enforce this. But it's one of the two. Or you're convincing and you enforce that we do not use these free rights which we have till 2026, 20, 
with the market stability reform, or you accept that we stay in the same story till 2026. But you cannot shout on one side, listen, we are happy with this circumstance as a total parliament, and on the other side say, why don't you do any new investments? Mm -hmm. That's up to you, mm -hmm. and that's up to a decision to be taken. Once you have taken that decision, I don't see any way out mm -hmm. as building this volume of renewables. And this is not because we like it or we hate it. Mm -hmm. This is the most economical way to give an answer in the, for the future. Are there any threats on this? Yes. There are two areas where you should pay attention. One area is the grids, and I'm talking both on demand side management, smart grids, they are needed to cope with the volume of renewables, the 45% which we want to build. They are needed interconnectors to cope cross-border, and they're both substandard at this moment to build this kind of volume. That should be handled. Last one, if we stay messing around with the markets, with national subsidy systems, and I'm not talking about renewables alone, I'm also talking about nuclear, I'm talking about coal, I'm talking about gas, I'm talking about anything, CCS. That is a threat for the mix at the end of the day. Because then we would have CO2 as a driver pushing us on renewables, but through national plans, we would go immediately in the opposite direction. And we would decide, do we need this coal plant, do we need this gas plant, do we need so many windmills on sea, do we need so many on land? I would say, let the CO2 determine at the end of the day. I'm very optimistic about the outcome if I read the 2050 study of the uh, European Commission, if I see how internal economics, it will go in this direction. But the key is in the hand of the Parliament how they go with the CO2 item. And if they give us a relaxing period till 26, then we have a nice time, we go all to the beach and we'll yeah. talk again at 26. Yeah. Okay. So that's really up to you if we all go to the beach, Frederick. You well, personally, we'll it, it we'll rests it. on your shoulders. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. On your left, yes. On your left, we have Thomas Becker, CEO of European Wind Energy Association. Thomas, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, well, if, if, this, if this package is supposed to be the motor of the necessary uh, energy transition, I would say, uh, I would say there are three three main conditions for, for in order to meet that. The first, and, and some of them have already been mentioned. I would like to say on the 27% of renewable energy target, and that was seen from our point of view disappointing, uh, disappointingly low, uh, it has, there has to be installed uh, uh, measures whereby the EU Commission the EU Commission becomes the watchdog of that target to be fulfilled. At the moment, and at is, as it is described in the Council text and other texts, it is very blurry how those 27% are going to be met. Mm -hmm. It is EU binding but not nationally binding, as I've said before. What does that mean? So if the EU doesn't meet the 27% by 2030, is the EU Commission going to take itself before the European Court and sue itself? Or how is it going to function? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really not clear, and that has to be folded out mm -hmm. very soon. So that, I think, is, is the first point. Secondly, I very much agree with Hans. Uh, the ETS system has to be um, revised, uh, strengthened. We, we really risk that once again, because remember, it's not the first time that the ETS system didn't function. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, <laughs> this was invented by say, some economists in Stanford, the ETS system, originally. Then it was taken over by some economists in, in Europe and then the EU Commission economists. And they installed this system, which has delivered, so far, nothing. The CO2 reduction we see today in Europe has been done by the re renewable energy target and, and by the energy efficiency target and not by the ETS system. So actually, we are putting all our effort into a system that so far has not functioned. And in the very end, unfortunately, the late night of the council meeting, it was, let's say, the uh, implementation was actually watered out even further so that, sorry to say, the countries that have already done a lot are, are supposed to do, do even more mm -hmm. to meet this target. So, so, so very important uh, that this, that this, that this, uh, that you get 
a real price on CO2 whereby uh, investments are directed towards low emission uh, uh, energy uh, provisions. My, 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 my third point, uh, Chair, is the interconnection. I very much agree with Hans. It is a prerequisite today. We, because of the lack of interconnection, each country in the EU has a capacity of meeting a peak, a peak uh, situation, which means, and so that 28 countries, more or less, not 28, but most countries today have a capacity to meet the ultimate challenge for the for the for the system, and 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 the, and of course, if you if you add up 28 times there, we have an overcapacity in the EU, which is which is which is uh, meaningless. We, we could, we, if we had smart interconnections, actually avoid that to the benefit of yeah. business and consumers. <coughs> that would lower the price. And then my, and then my, my, my final point, uh, and by the way, my, my good friend Frederick, uh, you know, you don't need, you don't need you keep in the room to, to tease you because, or to balance you, because I think it's so, it's so fantastic. Uh, to hear about um, now uh, Sweden finally, or a representative from Sweden finally be so much in favor of, of <coughs> renewables, it's, it's unfortunate that you weren't that eager uh, when you had the government. Uh, so, so, I mean, but now Sweden is in the right group and we're very happy for that, but before it was very difficult to drag them there. Uh, so just for the historic m memory. Okay. Um, and you had final a point, last point? Yep. Final point. Energy union. The energy union, of course, I mean, this is much more than just sitting talking about interconnections between one country and another country. Energy today has become a geopolitical uh, 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 theme. It has been for a long time. It is becoming even more now. And therefore, it is, it is, it is very fortunate and very interesting, the proposal by Mr. Juncker and by uh, others, um, uh, to, to create this, um, um, let's say, framework of an energy union in which we should be the best in renewables, the lowest emitting, and even be able to export those solutions to, to abroad. I okay. see that as a very, very, very uh, visionary uh, measure, and I really hope that this will take off politically. I know that the Commission right now in, is, is trying to to put it down to paper, what does the energy union mean? And, and I've, I, I so much cannot emphasize how much I think this is needed. This is needed to, to make energy a, let's say, a common European thing rather than a national uh, isolated mm -hmm. thing as, is, uh, as it has been, uh, unfortunately, so far. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. So I have to say, Guy, he's maybe not so much in your camp about the political binding. I think he's still a little bit worried about that, but we'll come back to that later. So you've heard from these uh, gentlemen. There's been an awful lot covered. I really hope that you guys have been inspired enough by that huge <coughs> breadth uh, of issues there to ask some questions in just a moment. But first of all, uh, Mache, what's your kind of, uh, what's your response to all of that? And also, where do you see Poland? What's Poland's vision going forwards? allow us also to follow uh, the ambitious uh, agenda to, to that extent that we are uh, that we are able to under our circumstances. However, mm, the devil is in the details, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. We will uh, have probably long discussions on the implementation of the derogation uh, package or, or the, the free allowances for, for energy, the compensation mechanisms that were agreed there. Uh, as we had in the previous uh, in the previous time on, on 10 C uh, of ETS, so probably we will have to get ready for that. Um, on the implementation, I would say that uh, 
when I was in the working party, when I was in the council, what member states asked for was flexibility. And I think that this package provides that. Uh, provides that in uh, the renewables, uh, provides that in uh, energy efficiency, and allows member states to, to implement also the uh, emission targets in a flexible way. And that is very good because uh, different member states have different circumstances. Uh, we see what the, situ what the global situation, the global picture is right now. Uh, some of the member states uh, really need to focus on the security uh, at this particular moment because of the Ukraine situation. And, um, and this will be provided not only by, the, by renewables, but also by other uh, means, although renewables as well as have a role here. Uh, so what we want to do uh, in this package, we want to uh, make the best use of our indigenous resources, including coal, um, but also renewables. Also, uh, we are have plans on nuclear. Uh, we want to do it in, with the use of the available technologies, uh, which are the clean coal technologies. And we believe that this package allows us uh, to do that, and we will discuss with, with the Commission on that. Uh, I heard also um, about the uh, about the disappointment uh, in some targets or in the package. I wouldn't be disappointed. I would agree with the uh, that this is a political commitment at the highest level. Uh, so I don't see why it should not be uh, delivered. Uh, I would also like to refer, perhaps as my last comment, uh, to the MSR, uh, because uh, several speakers were referring to that and uh, as the precondition for, uh, for uh, investments for a well-functioning uh, package. I would say that um, MSR is supposed to provide stability in, in what you're proposing. But introducing the backloading first <coughs> and the MSR se secondly is providing instability in the first design of the system. Uh, so this is the, the first intervention. And it is really difficult to believe that there will be not another uh, intervention unless the price is right. But uh, we believe it should be a market price. I don't know really that it should be uh, some kind of other price. Uh, I have a difficulty with that. Okay, thank you. I like that. I have a difficulty with that. That's kind of like a very polite way of saying <laughs> things. I like, I like that expression. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, just in case you can't wait to ask questions, normally people are a bit shy. Does anybody want to ask a question? Who would like to okay. go first? Oh, look, the lady there. Yes, right by the mic. Uh, just obviously hold it close like Madonna and let's hear uh, who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to give you any Madonna rendition, but uh, okay. yeah, uh, my name's Laurel Henning. I'm a journalist with MLEX. Um, a question to the commission, if I may. Um, on the idea of Europe, the EU, becoming the world number one in renewables, we hear this all the time at the moment, but not really how that's going to happen. And I just wondered if you had any solid ideas of yet of how you think which measures will be most useful to achieving that. Is the 27% target enough on its own? Or would you refer to the investment package, this 300 billion euros that we're going to see, which itself is only, I think, a three-year investment package anyway. So would that last long enough? And also, I, I really liked uh, Thomas Becker's point about would the EU sue itself at the European Court? And I just want to turn that back to you and whether you had any response to that because I thought that was a really interesting point. Thanks. Okay, two points for you, please. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, indeed, President Juncker made it very clear that we want to be world champion in, in renewables and I think it's, it's a very good signal because as well he, um, he uh, confirmed or underlined the idea of an energy union with one vice president. So energy is really on top of the agenda and the, the target of being... Um, of really reinforcing our renewable policies as well on top of the agenda. So I think this is, um, this comes at the right time. There will be different instruments. We will have this target of 27%, which we think is binding, which we will really follow up. Um, 
I think it is, it is ambitious because uh, already the reference scenario con requires considerable efforts by the different stakeholders in order to, to be achieved. And then we have to top this up by more than, than 3%. Um, and in addition, of course, you need to, um, we will need to do a further integration of the renewables market. So we will have to see interconnections, we will have to, to build the grid. So there will be a lot of things around this renewable target which we will have to achieve together. So I think that is, it is important. And you should not forget, of course, that we have always said it is a minimum target. So member states are entirely free to go beyond that. This is what we have agreed to do at least together. But we know that certain member states like Germany or Scandinavian countries are willing and uh, are desiring to go beyond that and we, will, we are the last to stop them because we have made very clear in our roadmap 2050 that we think that renewables are an essential pillar of a decarbonisation policy. So we think this package keeps us on track for decarbonisation because we have 40% greenhouse gas reductions in 2030. That keeps us on the path to 2050 where we want to achieve 80%. We should have at least 27% of renewables, but it can be more, but this is what is absolutely required. We will follow that up with this governance structure, which should be um, an efficient monitoring tool because we will have a dialogue with member states and we will ask member states to submit their plans and we will basically follow what they, what they tell us and we will have a discussion on these plans. We will not just put the plans in the drawer and then forget them, but we will really work on these plans. So we think there could be efficient tools. and. Of course, there is the possibility of having as well European support for renewables, and you rightly point out to the Juncker plan, 300 billion uh, euros investment in three years, and certainly renewables and energy efficiency should be part of the um, targets for these investments. So we will certainly work on that, that we as well provide some financial support in order to accelerate renewable development and integration into the energy landscape. And on the hot question, which is, if it doesn't all work and collectively they just, you're going to see they ain't going to deliver, or are you going to see yourself? I think that's kind of what you wanted to know. I I'm afraid you can't escape that question. She needs to know. She needs to know. Yeah. Um, first, we think, I mean, we, um, we, we are first, we are quite optimistic that we will achieve it because, uh, no, because <laughs> I, th I think it's a bit, it's a, bit uh, a wrong start to start by the negative and by the presumption that everything breaks. I mean, you don't build a house in the expectation that it will burn down. So, um, we build a house here or the target of 27% because we believe that this is, makes economically perfect sense. And I will explain you why. Because we have, in the reference scenario, we will achieve something like 24%. We had a very in-depth impact assessment where we come to the conclusion that if you achieve a 40% greenhouse gas reduction target yes. alone, you would That's achieve, in a cost-efficient scenario, 26.5% renewables. Yes. So it just makes sense to have this 27% economically that's why we believe, uh, and we have the pledges from member states that we will be very close. But we have said in our January communication, uh, we will insist on plans which will, um, which will cumulatively uh, top up this target. And if it will not work, then we will have to reflect on European measures in order to achieve it, because we feel committed to this target. Okay. So basically he's saying if it doesn't work, he, he will give you his telephone number, and in a few years <laughs> you can <laughs> ring him up and see where we stand there, and then maybe you can go to court with him and he can see himself. Okay, I think just uh, so just come to you, just Thomas. You wanted to. Yeah, um, it's, it's not intervene. fair because uh, of, uh, obviously uh, you you represent an institution, Indeed. and uh, we don't want to to fry you too much. I'm saying <laughs> to the gentleman from the commission, but I mean you you say it yourself. Twenty six point five percent will come by itself if you reach the forty percent CO two target. So twenty seven percent of renewables is perhaps then not that ambitious. It's a, it's a, it's an, in essence, a non, a non-target. Uh, perhaps we could have even done without that. Uh, so, 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 th in that sense, I don't think that it is, it is too ambitious. And that my, my second point is, I, I, I do think that it is worth noting that what has given us CO2 reductions in the EU so far is, according to those who are working with these things. The, the, the renewable energy target for 20 and the energy efficiency target. Those are the two measures that have actually m delivered the CO2 <coughs> reduction that we are seeing now, unfortunately less than we should have, but that is what has delivered. And, and again, unless the ETS system is thoroughly revised and we get a price on ETS, on, on the CO2, uh, it's going to be very difficult. Okay, just before, is it a quick one? Because I'm going to, yeah? Okay, the gentleman here, yeah, from the EWEA. Uh huh. Hi. 
Um, Pierre Tardieu from uh, the European Wind Energy Association. Um, I, I'd like to uh, agree with you, um, European Commission, that when you build a house, uh, you're not thinking that it's going to burn down, but you do get uh, you do get an insurance policy, and I think this is what we're missing here. So I'd like to pick up quickly on the points made, made by uh, Guy Lenz, um, with the idea of having a very specific um, approach with national plans starting in 2016, uh, with very clear national measures on which each of the member states are going to do in terms of renewables, energy efficiency, etc. I think this is what this brings to the table uh, is transparency, and this this ties in really neatly with the uh, with the energy union uh, concept, whose uh, opening pillar I think is uh, deals also with trust uh, and with a better coordination of uh, national energy policies. So I'd like to yeah hear from you how you see those different things tying in. Uh, the implementation of the 2030 climate and energy package uh, and the energy union which really gives us an avenue to better coordinate energy policy and and truly achieve this i think we do need that uh, uh, that that policy okay yes do you want to come back no no i mean i think that's no, a question for the commission because yeah. I, I i fully agree with what i i said before J just to come back to the question thank you for this but just to come back to the question about how to if i may if I had something yep. to say about what the Commission should do. Um, well, there is someone of the Commission I know, so mm. it's from my country. So, uh, <laughs> Well, we're all from the same family. So, <laughs> three points. The first point I would say, for, and I repeat on that um, also for you, I mean, this is at least 27%, and I repeat it again. I mean, this is not the view of the actual President of the Commission. And I know him. So, so, frankly, I would not be that pessimistic. This is a decision of European Council based on that Council and of a previous Commission. So we have a new Commission. We have five years. And it is at least 27%. So I'm, I'm not pessimistic at all on that, first of all. But three things, because putting targets is something. Then you have to achieve it. My first point is, and I insist on that, we have to, from now to 2020, we have to correct and refine the actual system. The actual system, the actual directive is not perfect. Okay? Then, I mean, you know that. There are many things that we, ha we can refine. We have the time to refine it, uh, to, ma to make it much more, uh, much more, much more cost-efficient. And I repeat again what I said before. We have to open the directive. We, o we have to open the feeding systems in, in regional cooperation to lower the price, really to to create a European dimension on a directive that is not very EU dimension because, because it's national targets. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we have to do. We have to correct it from now until 2020 to be ready then for 2030 on this directive. There is many things to refine. First thing. Second thing is you have talked about the package of the 30 billion package. There must be a part of it in research and development and there must be money on that from this package on research and development in renewable and energy efficiency, that's true. But I know the Commission is working on that. And the third thing, but that was uh, also said by, by, by our colleague here, uh, yes, I do believe that, I mean, it's, it's, frankly, it's just copy-paste what we've done in 1925 in, in for, for the National Plans of Reform. You know, I was there at the time in the presidency, so it's just a copy-paste of that. It's a success. So I think we have to do it exactly the same way. To come back to what is legally binding, political binding, I know that political binding can be much stronger than legally binding when the Commission will maybe not there to bring you to the court when you not achieve exactly your target. So, I mean, what is now important is that we have a binding target at EU level. That is key. And this must be declined and defined now by national plans, energy national plans, that will start a dialogue with the Commission and then going to the Council having peer reviews and maybe peer pressure on that. Exactly the same way we've done that for the European semester. It has worked. We, end that, we have that now in stability pact. We can have that also in energy. And we need to have that in energy as a political pressure by national plans of energy. Thank you. Okay. Can I just, just and I, this is just simply, it doesn't mean we can't go back to this, but just because our time is limited, I want to also open up a little bit into other areas and bring another uh, couple couple of our panelists in. So there'll be something for you in just a moment, Hans. But first of all, I could, look, <laughs> come back to you. Um, the European Parliament is initiating work on energy security. So how do you see this kind of fitting into things? And also, I have another question for you, which is when are you going to have your say? 
When is the Parliament going to have their say in all of this? Because you weren't involved in the target. So what are you expecting next? You're going to be involved in the... Uh, in the next in the next of ledger, you're going to be having a look at the ETS and the reforms mm -hmm. of the ETS and be involved in there. What are your expectations for your involvement? So on the first is the energy security, and the second, what do you expect going forward in terms of having your say? I think that no matter uh, on which uh, political standpoint, uh, no matter what standpoint you represent, you, you do want to say if you were running for the European Parliament in, in May, because this is, this is one of the biggest uh, challenges we have to face. Uh, there was a big debate in the spring in the House, uh, mm -hmm. And obviously, this parliament would like to have it say, have a say on its own. Uh, but I think there are many things uh, uh, we need to go down to the deep on uh, how, how to make the grid working. What is actually energy efficiency meaning? Because I'm one of those who think that we should be as efficient as possible in uh, every single product, every single unit should be uh, as efficient as possible. But I don't see it as a single goal to reduce our consumption of electricity. Uh, I see it as a way of building market a mechanism to actually get more electricity on the market because my computer is more efficient, my uh, uh, refrigerator is more efficient, so that I can finally fuel my car with electricity instead of using mm -hmm. gas. Uh, and I think that that's one of the points we also need to make because if we're really going to address the big schemes of emission, we also have to talk about the elephant in the room, and that's our transportation, uh, which is not affected uh, uh, in a good way on this. Uh, it, when it comes to security, yeah, I would say that getting a greener system is the most secure one of them all, because we will produce our energy ourselves, we will be uh, less independent, but we also need smart grids uh, uh, for the possibility, for, for example, in Sweden, the debate on uh, uh, electricity especially and, and, and on energy in total has been very uh, like Sovietic style. We, we, sh uh, we use 100%, we should produce 100%. What I want is a system that makes us use only 50% and still continue to increase our production so we can sell electricity to the Baltic states, to Poland, to Germany, uh, which, which, is, uh, which would be uh, very much greener. And I, uh, I, I also hear what, what, the, what the Polish representation is saying here, but uh, I think that... Um, Poland is a bit misunderstood because when I talk to different actors working on producing green energy <laughs> that are acting in Poland, they say, uh, well, when we meet locals and we are trying to form a new medium-sized combustion plant or something like that, uh, initially where we meet a resistance, but when it's in place and it's working... Uh, the debate turns uh, in that local area. Mm -hmm. So I think that actually Poland can be one of the keys to the solution to actually creating uh, uh, b both the grid, the security, and the greener production. Uh, and uh, officially, they are always uh, uh, taking a, another position that I am. Uh, but I see that there are many actors from the industry involved in Poland, trying to build up district heating, uh, using more renewables and so on. And especially in the northern part of Poland, there are uh, really interesting uh, things happening on wind power Absolutely. and water power and so on. So I think that... Uh, Maybe not the, uh, the, the the political leadership of Poland will be taking the the leader uh, the leader flag, but there's actually but there's a, a really interesting things happening from underneath in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, th those are just a few uh, other things, and ju I just have to mention uh, uh, to, to Mr. Becker that uh, one part of being a government and your own, your party is only representing six percent in the government. It, that means that you cannot have the whole say of the government. But the leader of my party has been very clear the whole time that we are aiming for 100% renewables and nothing less in our energy mix. But we had two parties from EPP. Uh, the EPP has a tendency of not being the greenest one. So we still, I, I'm kind of naive. I don't give up hope on them. Uh, and everyone can change uh, in small steps. So we actually managed to push the two EPP parties in our last government quite far. Not as far as we wish, but... Th th there's room for, for improvement for them, but both in this house and in the house at home in Sweden. Okay. Macha, do you, are you, what, do you approve of what he said about the region? Not so much perhaps something central, but something more at a regional level, that there is stuff going on, there is positive stuff at regional level? I yeah. would say that we are not that far away. Um, I would agree that there is a lot of going on in Poland. I would agree that uh, Poland has made a significant uh, emission reduction effort. Poland has made a significant effort in uh, developing renewables and actually we are over our curve uh, at this particular moment. 
Uh, so yes, uh, there is the potential, and what we have asked was the, the flexibility. What we have asked for was the some kind of compensation mechanism to uh, to take into account the costs for the society and for the budget that will be resulting from ambitious uh, policy. And I think we have received that, and uh, we need to take into account the global picture. Uh, even though the developments uh, are and can be impressive in Poland, uh, you need not to forget that uh, over 80, almost 90% of our energy mix is still coal, and we need to do something about that. Uh, we, uh, and we have plans to reduce the coal in our mix, but it will stay until 2050, definitely. Uh, and there is a huge potential also in reducing emissions from that. Uh, so. We need to have a holistic approach, including renewable. Uh, I think that we are not that far away, really. Yeah, okay, you want to quickly uh, reply? Just, yeah. uh, just two small ones. We also have the um, uh, the MCP, uh, medium-sized combustion plant uh, emissions, which uh, I'm a rapporteur for in, in the EU committee, uh, which is affecting 143,000 medium-sized combustion plants in uh, all of the European Union uh, that will actually have a big impact also on emissions and what's possible to do and not to do and I think that we'll come back in <laughs> several discussions there. It was just some of my friends up here who mentioned the Energy e Union. Uh, um, I, I together with the, uh, our ALDE coordinator in ENVI has taken up an initiative in, within the ALDE group to have a standing working group on the Energy Union just to try to sort out what is the union in our eyes. We want to take a leadership in this because we see it as one of the biggest things that will pass the House of this mandate. Uh, but we have to make sure that we are actually actually know what we're talking about. I talk about uh, smart, uh, efficient grids uh, that makes it possible to get uh, a market working within the European Union. Several colleagues from other parties uh, are talking about actually having a buyer's organization mm. to, to pressure the price of coal and gas. And that, that's not what I'm talking about. So we, we actually need some clarification on, on uh, uh, fr from, from the Commission's perspective. We need the Council to take a look on what the Energy Union is. And also, we have to start working on it in the house. And the last thing, when we have someone from DG Energy here, please don't take away the MCP. It's really important. 400,000 people are dying too early every year within the European Union due to emissions from medium-sized combustion plants. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to... If I'm going to... Uh, did you want to come back on this specifically, or was it a general question? A new topic. Can I just raise a new topic, and then I'll come to you directly after? If you, just to hold for a minute. Is it... Is it, do you want to reply off the back of this, Guy? No, just about energy union, but... Just, yeah, please, just, yeah, just, just keep it brief, because I think otherwise hands could just walk out just the room, because I haven't asked <laughs> any questions you're at doing, all. You're doing very Go fine. Go for it. <laughs> Go on. No, 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 just just yeah? because we're, we're Absolutely. maybe extending the discussion. Um, about energy union, just um, I, I fully agree with what, what was, was just said now. Um, I, I see... I see for for most important pillars, n nothing nothing special, but it is about energy security. That's clear. It is about resilience. It is about diminishing our external invoice of fossil fuel. We were talking about 300 billions of Juncker plans, but we spend 400 billions uh, of fossil fuel invoice every year. If we could just cut it by two, it's 200 billions that we could invest in energy efficiency, in renewable, exactly what we just discussed, mm -hmm. which will increase. Our, our energy uh, resilience. Third thing, um, it's about prices. It's about the prices for consumers and competitiveness of prices. Mm -hmm. That's also a part of the package. And the fourth part, which is probably new, and that makes the, the energy union complete, that is about growth and jobs. Energy is an industrial policy. I mean, everybody working in this area knows that. Maybe in, in around Schumann Roundabout, we forget about it, but for, for, for the last years and decades, Energy was a sub-policy of something. It was, first of all, a sub-policy of, of internal market. Then it was a, a sub-policy of climate. And Energy Union has this merit that now energy is a proper mm -hmm. policy, will be a proper policy on the same level of other policies. And that includes a lot of pillars, including the capacity, the social and, 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 and economic capacity to create jobs and growth. All right, thank you. I will come to you in just a moment. I do want to come to, to, to Hans, because you obviously talked a lot about the ETS, and others have talked about the ETS, and I've got to ask the obvious question. It was kind of weakened as a result of the council conclusion, so do you really think it's kind of 
viable if we are serious about the EU's decarbonisation targets? I mean, where are we sitting with that? It's, you know, you've got the free uh, allocation, sure. heavy industry, the free allowances. What's that? How, how has that impacted on it? What does it mean? I'm not sure if you're serious in this. I'm really not sure. But it's not the industry who decides how much carbon we should save. It's the politics. And if they don't mm. want to give a clear signal that we should move, mm -hmm. we will not move. Mm -hmm. And if they give a clear signal, we'll move. But you cannot do two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Say, decarbonize, go in the direction of renewables, and we couldn't care about CO2 mm -hmm. emissions. Mm -hmm. You have to make a clear, consistent choice. And if you're saying we're going for 43%, but we know that we got in the back pocket enough rights till 2026, mm -hmm. then you're cheating, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. I call that cheating. Mm -hmm. You have to do one of the two, or you have to be clear and say, listen, all those additional rights, yeah which came in due to the renewables, due to the China one euro rights, which we imported, due to the recessions, and I know all the reasons for that. Or we take them out and we go for a serious system, or we don't take them out. And yeah. if you don't take them out, accept the consequences of that and accept that this is going to be at least till 2026 completely failing in this package. Hmm. It's one or the two. That's one. Two, on the security of supply, you were raising that. Sorry if I'm too narrow in my thinking, because gas is, is a security of supply issue. How much gas do we use in our fuel mix? At this moment, 16% of the generations is gas-based. Of that, one-third is imported, that's 5%. Could we miss that? Yes, we could miss that on the generation side tomorrow. No worry about that. What is the biggest worry? Some co-generation in Bulgaria, Romania, the Baltics, and Finland would switch to much more dirty fuels at that moment. The security of supply issue is not driving the electricity business. There's enough electricity on the market at this moment. Too much. If you use gas as a security of supply issue to go to renewables, you're using the wrong driver. The renewables are very instrumental in the deep carbonization uh, agenda. They're needed. Third remark, how do you ensure that this is done, this 27% or whatever the number would be at the end of the day? You don't enforce that with legal cases. I don't believe it them. We had a 3% what was it, deficit on the currency. And all the member states signed off. Which member state kept the 3%? Which one was taken to court? And to which one did we send the army? None of them. Are you thinking that we are going to do more severe measurements no. on renewables? Forget it. Yeah, you're right. The renewables are not driven by legal targets. They're needed at the end Absolutely. of the day. They're crucial to get it the decarbonization agenda done, they're the most economic solution. And the enemy is not that we don't have the legal framework. The enemy is that we're messing around with it, mm. that we're not clear on the CO2 targets. The enemy is that we're trying to build in all kinds of other systems which would reward. And that is not on the renewables alone, because we have been bashing from your electric quite a bit the subsidies on renewables. It has become worse. It's also on the nuclear, it's also on the coal, it's also on the gas, and it's called stability reserves and, I don't know, what the, uh, market reforms or uh, strike prices or whatever you have towards any, any ministry in any country has thought of something to orchestrate this. Yeah. If we get these systems going on, then we will not have the CO2 as a driver and we will not go to this renewable environment. Yeah. And if you don't get this change done, don't complain about it but accept then the national policies which are completely different over the 27 member states with whatever the outcome will be. I would not go for that direction. And I would urge the parliament to look at this and I would urge the member states to have a cooperation on this and to make sure that we go in a consistent way and not try to do things which are... Uh, how can you explain to a foreigner outside of Europe that we subsidize nuclear in the UK that we do not subsidize it in France and that we forbid it in Austria and mm -hmm. Germany. And that we try to build an interconnector to have a homogeneous market on that. Mm -hmm. how, how, yeah. how would you explain that to somebody outside Europe? Mm -hmm. How would you explain that I get a, for a windmill in Finland zero at this moment mm -hmm. compared to the market price and that I get 100 euros in Germany for the same windmill? I don't know if it's today the case, but it, it was the case at least. That is unexplainable, in my opinion. And then we connect these countries and we call, to call that a European Energy Union. I don't call that a mm -hmm. European Energy Union. I think we have a lot of work to do in that area. And there I would like to see a much more homogeneous approach. I think that will be the driver 
for a renewable environment and a decarbonization agenda at the end of the day. And all kinds of legal measurements, forget it. I've seen enough of those. Okay, thank you. I think two comments. I haven't forgotten you. Is, it, is yours entirely unrelated to what we're discussing? Is it a new pasture? Great. Okay, hold that thought. I'll come back to you. Who put their hand up? Can you keep it short, please? Because yeah, yeah, time I'll is... Oh, yeah, time is running. Yeah, Go on. I'll, I'll try to. The problem is I get paid to talk a lot. Ah, uh, no, really? Uh, actually, it, it's quite interesting. We talk to uh, I industry, especially high-tech industry, you know, uh, like for Philips. We had a green growth uh, uh, breakfast just a few weeks ago in the house, and the guy from Philips, he was saying, well, if you only go for 30% uh, in efficiency target, that was when we were still were talking about 30%, he said, we can put down our R&D department because that will uh, d be done by itself. Because you will change your refrigerator, you will change your lamps and so on, and that will make us go to 30%. Uh, uh, and it's very interesting when the industry says, just like you are saying, we need high targets to start moving. We want to put more in our, into R&D than we are already doing. But what, what, what the po politicians now are saying that you don't need to do R&D because this will fix itself. And, and mm -hmm. that's a big problem. Uh, what what uh, many are forgetting now is that, uh, for example, in Sweden, we also have a heavy CO2 tax in addition to the emission scheme in addition to that one. That could have been a, so, uh, uh, a big solution during the financial crisis if uh, more countries would have imposed a CO2 tax. That it would have been pushing the debate much, much further. It would have been giving l big incomes for the different countries, but people were afraid to. Then we look to industry. Is the Swedish industry doing bad? Is the Swedish unemployment higher? Are uh, industries moving away from Sweden? No, no, no. But the Swedes and we never do anything bad, do no, they? No, we do bad things. <laughs> they just don't. They one of the we shouldn't talk about the Second World <laughs> War at this moment. The last thing is actually <laughs> what we have to do is make sure that the scheme starts working. And when we are uh, going down to the uh, to the um, um, MSR at the moment, uh, I, I'm trying to propose, uh, we had the first discussion yesterday in the ITU committee, uh, the, uh, a permanent cancellation mechanism. So when you take out um, allowances uh, from the market to the reserve, you should also have a, a, every second year uh, a, a surveillance of this. And if there has been more than like 500 million um, uh, allowances in the reserve, you should cancel 20% of that. Because that is due to what's also happening at the market right now. When we're moving towards more of renewables, there will be a lot of emissions. Uh, there will be a surplus. And we have to make sure that uh, we have a 5% takeout every year. But if we have a vast, if we have millions and millions in the reserve, we need to cancel them in some way that doesn't frighten the industry but gives a clear direction and uh, where it's actually not possible to get them back. That was, now I'll be, we'll be quiet. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Thomas, you wanted to come back on something I think earlier that was no, brought no, up no, or no, just this? this? Is okay, the, yep. well, it's, it's, a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah, it's on the energy union. Mm -hmm. I, has, I actually said it <coughs> yesterday as well. Um, it's, it's, I, 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 I do agree with, uh, with Hans uh, about the, uh, let's say, absurdity uh, at the moment uh, and the need to do something to harmonize more. There is one thing we, we cannot get around, and that's the, that's the very, very uh, sensitive uh, issue, namely... 194. Yeah, 194 in the treaty. We need to at now address... Okay, everybody uh, recognizes the need to harmonize this. How much sovereignty are member states going to give away? Because that is what is needed. Without that, we can forget the energy union. It will be an, an intellectual exercise with no meaning. It only is interesting if member states are willing to say, in the, in the name, in the sake, for the sake of the common good, as they did with trade, many years ago mm -hmm. with the internal market. Mm -hmm. We yeah. agreed that we need an internal market, we need Trade to take away barriers, yeah. because for the, for the common good, for, for creating markets. And, and who today is questioning uh, the reasoning or the, 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 the positive sides of the internal market? It's exactly the same with energy now. Mm -hmm. We need to tear down borders, we need member states to recognize that they need to give away sovereignty, I would say to the Commission, definitely, 
because I see no other institution that would be able to, to handle this in a, in a neutral way, in order to make this more harmonized uh, energy, uh, uh, let's say, union with where we reason and where we do not have this overcapacity and where we, where we, where we uh, uh, send the energy where the demand is and where we produce it where it is feasible to produce it. It's, okay. it's not that difficult. Of course, this is what I'm mentioning now, extremely difficult because at the moment, as you see in Europe, it goes direct other way, namely member states and council are beefing up. They are taking back power. They are taking back their, their let's say, sovereignty. Uh, there's the austerity. There are many things going on in Europe. But I think that we, representing, uh, let's say, this community, need to counter that now and say, on, on energy, the only reasonable thing is to try to, to make a, a one market and let's not okay. and without 28 administrations. So what do you think? Does it risk becoming just an intellectual exercise, he said? Member states need to be prepared to give up sovereignty? What's your answer to him? Well, or I a bit more. Ask Frederick. Yeah. <laughs> I can say a bit more because there are so many points I would like at least to comment upon, but yes, we'll come back to this. Yeah. I'm very grateful, especially what, uh, what Guy has said on the, on, the, on the governance, because I think that it's really crucial to understand this. Um, we think that what I tried to explain in the beginning, of course we, have a, we try to have an insurance and we have a fallback position, but we think that the renewable target makes a lot of sense because we, we reflected a lot on the right to, bring, to get the right targets together, which makes sense, because in the end, I fully share your view, you can only persuade people. We don't have a police or an army force. We need to have something which, is make, which makes economic sense and which is persuasive. And we believe that these targets make a lot of sense. And what we think is as well, and then I'm very grateful for your remark, we shouldn't forget that the world in which we are living in is not perfect neither because it's very national, the, the renewables policy. And this was appropriate and right in order to get the renewable policy started, to get it off the hook, because renewables were small, we wanted to protect them, we had national targets, national support schemes, we wanted to have divergence, everybody should try, but now we have to move to the next step. And I think it's, it's as well a chance that it will now be done on a more European level, and the Commission has stressed that we want to like to see more cooperation between member states, more opening up of these support schemes, more opening up of the renewable policy. And the governance should be understood, I think, as a chance, because we, we start a new mandate, because we will have a more holistic approach. Because something which was missing in the renewable policy always was a bit, we were only looking at the target, but we were not looking at market integration, at market uptake or mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. The governance will allow us to sit together with the member states and to look at their national energy strategy and to see, does it fit? And in that respect, that will allow us as well to see, does it fit with your neighbor? Because what we have seen in the past is that everybody does his national energy strategy, and then afterwards, it doesn't, it doesn't really fit, but it has a direct repercussion. Because if German renewables is flowing via the Polish grid, this has a repercussion. And if uh, Germany exits nuclear, this has a repercussion on the electricity prices in France. So there must be coordination. And this governance, <coughs> where we have a comprehensive national energy strategy, which is discussed, not just targets. It should not just be that member states communicate us the three or four mm -hmm. targets, and then we, we say, okay, this is right or not. We want to have a dialogue. They should dialogue with the neighbors, with the region, and they should dialogue with us so that in the end we have a coordinated approach which, which fits. And there we could balance. And then I come back to the last point on the treaty change. I think there we, can, we have the chance to balance that member states have different prerogatives. The treaty is as it stands. We might reflect if in the future another treaty would be nicer, but I think what, member, what people expect from us is action now. And a treaty change would take us years. It's difficult to achieve, as you all know, and we have to work for the time being, with the instruments we have. And I think there we are well advised to try to do this coordination, to leave members in the room for national preferences, but to coordinate that. And I think there, governance could be a very innovative <coughs> and efficient tool to do that it's well understood. And in the end, if, it, if what we agree makes some sense, we have some monitoring, we have peer pressure, we might even come up with some European added measures on top of it, like be it support or some to push, like for energy efficiency, we can have horizontal legislation, so it's not only member states who can do something. I think we can, we can end up in a rather, with a rather reasonable result.
Okay, so for you, there doesn't need to be any more sticks. There's plenty of carrots. It's a, the right and correct strategy. No, and I mean, you've got some people on this panel on your side here. No, I, I think I mean, we can be reflected. You can, of course, think about if Article 194 is a perfect legal basis or should we have a new treaty on energy. In all this, you can, you can reflect. Um, and, of course, the Commission would be the last one to say, uh, well, why should it not be a fully integrated legal basis? But I think the people and the undertakings in Europe, they really expect answers now. Mm -hmm. And to start a debate on a treaty change, which will take us for years and years, will not reply to the demand outside there in the market and with the operators. So I think we, we should concentrate first on the issues which are, which are burning, and we have to, to, to resolve them with the tools at, at our hands. And we try with the governance to, to, to come up with an innovative tool which would help us to, to overcome these difficulties. Okay, thank you. So they're not going to, you won't have your day in court. That's clear. Okay, so Guy, and I think, yes, you did put your hand up first, but if you could hold just one moment. You yeah, want just, to just, just quickly to, yeah. to what said Kilian and, and, and to reflect on energy union and change of treaty and these kind of things. Um, first of all, yes, it will take too much time, it's long, and probably we won't succeed to change a treaty on, the, on that issue. First. But second, I, I do believe, and I can prove it, it's not necessary. Uh, from 20, uh, 2006, we have mm. created a pentatural form of energy, and your country, you have the North Pole um, Association. We have proven that ministers together from 2006 in our region, Benelux, Germany, France, and Austria, when you put ministers together, they talk to each other, and they see the interest to exchange on why do I have my own capacity market? Uh, because this is very expensive. Maybe... Maybe I should not invest in my capacity market, but look at France or, 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 or Netherlands or others. Maybe they can balance my system. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you don't need to change it. You need a regional dimension. And if you explain that uh, to ministers, because they are not very you know, um, educated to, to, to talk about this kind of, of things, they see, they see immediately the interest. They see the interest that you, you should not invest in a new X plan, coal or, any, or, or nuclear plan. If on the other side of the border there is somebody doing exactly the same. That is the, the reason why we need a regional dimension for internal market, capacity mechanism, uh, renewable development, energy security. I mean, that is what we need. And, 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 that is, and that is exactly what we need, and we, we don't need more. I mean, we don't need any change of the treaty because it will automatically come. You will come to the decision, okay, I do not do this. I don't need somebody from Brussels to tell me that. I will understand that I don't need as a minister to invest in this or this because my neighbor will do it for me, or I will do it with my neighbor because he will open his feed-in tariff and I will join his system. So you, must be, so you must be feeling quite excited about how you can take things forward under the presidency next year. Yes. You're quite clear about where Luxembourg is. We have some ideas. Okay, so, <laughs> some a clue, idea. yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I just turn to you? Because, yes. you know, this man is... Thank you very much. Um, I think that on uh, 194, without any deep coordination with other member states, I would agree with Fergie that this is something that uh, will probably not be possible to change in the foreseeable future, uh, although I also agree that the regional approach uh, to security, to, to, to coordination is uh, important. Uh, the <coughs> what Kilian said was very important, that the uncontrolled uh, development of renewables in Germany caused problems for us uh, because of the loops was going through Poland and Czech Republic. Uh, more coordination more uh, would, be, would be more appropriate. I would also like to refer shortly to the energy union, because uh, you referred, if I will remember, to some ideas of a buyer's club. Uh, I would say that you have to remember where, uh, what, what revived the whole idea, and it was the situation abroad, the situation in Ukraine and the threat of uh, lack of supplies of gas uh, in, in the winter. And, um, and the whole idea, as it was presented by our Prime Minister Tusk, uh, was uh, to solve this particular problem fast, really. Uh, and uh, renewables and energy efficiency are, of course, part of the solutions, but they are not immediate. Uh, we need to increase the bargaining power of the EU. And there are several ways to do that. Common purchases uh, are are among them, but also the EU emergency planning and there the EU and regional dimension come, comes into, into place. The commission assistance in talking to external suppliers, 
transparency in the gas markets, diversification, including indigenous resources. So I would say that we have to be functional and introduce the regional and EU dimension where, where we really need it. Right now we need it, uh, we need solidarity and uh, regional coordination, EU coordination in security the most. Okay, all right. I'm going to park it there for a minute, unless you've got... Yeah? Can we just hold it there for a minute? Because uh, I think the clock is ticking a little bit, and I would love this gentleman. It better be good. <laughs> We've been waiting. Poor, poor you. Patient, I put you on the spot for, like, patient. the last 25 <laughs> minutes. Yes. <laughs> Almost feeling. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> for um, yes, uh, Mr. Fainley mentioned uh, mobility <laughs> as the elephant in the room. Um, I think there's, in fact, another elephant sitting right next to it, and that is uh, cost-effective energy storage. Yeah, um, yeah, I yeah. think whether you go for 100% renewables like some of the Scandinavian countries have indicated or whether, as in Poland, you'd like to continue using your indigenous uh, resources but uh, integrate renewables as part of that, energy storage is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, yet, if I look at the amounts of money that go into public and private money that go into research and development of, of, um, of energy storage, they are much further in the United States than they are in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions, both for Mr. Van Berg and Mr. Becker. Um, can you please indicate how critical, how relevant um, energy storage is for your respective uh, sector? And secondly, what can be done at the European level to boost, uh, to promote research and development in energy storage? Thank you. Okay, yes. Thomas, do you want to come back first? I'd like to hear what Hans has to okay. say. <laughs> okay, Hans. Energy storage. You know, let, let me. Your first question was, is it important? Yes, it's crucial. There are a couple of elements which are driving the whole energy market. That's demand, that's supply, and that's storage. Those three should be in the equilibrium. We are not in the doing that at this moment. There's no confrontation of demand, storage and supply. And if we confront it, we confront it with a different set of values. We are capable of valuing certain degrees of generation or demand in a different way and don't match the values of that. The orphan of that is storage. Because storage was not seen as crucial and that meant that demand and supply would be in equilibrium and storage would play no role. The result of that is, if you look at storage, for example, and I've talked to my friends in Austria, who are building new pumps, pump storages, that they're saying, no, thank you. We have to pay a lot of money to get it in through the grids, to get it out through the grids, and the differential in the market value is too low, we don't do it. If you look at hydrogen storage, and the efficiency of that, there needs to be quite some things to be done to get this energy stored in the right way and to get it through fuel cells back on the market at the end of the day or as gas back on the market. Are we pleading now to give an artificial price to storage again compared to demand and supply? The answer is no. That should be done in the market. Are we pleading for research and development on this? Yes. Mm -hmm. There should be spent yeah. money on Absolutely. this. Significant money should be spent mm -hmm. on this. Am I sharing that everything outside Europe is better than inside Europe? The US is doing much better on this. My answer is no. If I'm over in the US and I hear their complaints and their worries, then I'm not so unhappy to fly back to Europe. Am I unhappy with developments in Japan where the total national bill of payment is distorted due to the volumes of gas they're buying from Qatar? They got a huge problem there. Am I happy if I walk around in Beijing and look at the air quality there mm -hmm. and the volume of coal which is emitted, which is much more than, by the way, than Europe, but nevertheless it's such a huge volume that the total air is polluted. No, I'm not so happy there. Am I happy in Australia, where I'm seeing that they're struggling also with their whole CO2 and their ETS system? No, they're not done yet either. So it's very fashionable, I think, in Europe to complain that we're lagging behind on everything. I will join you once in a while for that. But be also a little bit proud of what we have achieved in Europe. 
Although we took leadership, I think we're not doing so bad. But don't tell the European Commission, otherwise they slow down. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the first time I've heard anyone in any debates here. We must be proud of what we're doing in yeah. Europe. That's great. We might never hear that. So thank oh, you very much. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah you're, you're spot on. I was yeah. about to make a comment about that earlier. You're right. Thomas. We should be very proud. We're world champions in energy in Europe today, as we are. And everybody, you know, praising what is going on in the United States should go there and they should mm -hmm. try to uh, exactly. have a company installed there and mm -hmm. see, uh, I mean, be a consumer of energy, then mm -hmm. you get a totally, mm -hmm. totally mm -hmm. different yeah, picture, uh, okay. uh, including the price. Okay, can uh, I just hold that thought just one minute because I hate sure. people to have to scuttle off yeah. stage without thanking them. Do you want to make a, a last statement? Have you said everything you no, would like to? No, it will to? be too long. Be, uh, oh, God, okay. Yeah. All right, can we please give a round of applause to our lovely MEP who's got to rush off and do some more talking. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, so there was the question asked about the importance of storage yeah. also for your industry. Yeah. I think you were coming to yeah, that. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Certainly, storage is something that has to be uh, exploited uh, much more and developed. Uh, it, it, I, I get, you get depressed when you walk around in Beijing. I get depressed when I hear about the Spaniards producing 130, 140 percent of their energy need uh, for nine days during Christmas from wind alone. Yes. From wind alone. Mm -hmm. Not being able to sell the surplus anywhere because the Iberian Peninsula is, uh, is closed, is closed. Mm -hmm. not being able to store it somewhere. It, it, it's absurd. It's, it's like uh, throwing away money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, of course, this is a very important priority area. Again, as I think we have said earlier, if the political side, if the politicians, and I very much agree with Anton Berger there, if they would like something to happen in society, they must take the lead. They must guide the investment. Mm -hmm. it, don't, it, it won't happen by itself. Mm -hmm. And if the European politicians, the political level, if they, if they think that energy storage is reasonable, then it, they must put money behind R&D on energy storage, substantial money, mm -hmm. and, 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 and systematically, as we are doing with the IT, for example, as we are doing with pharmaceuticals, uh, there nobody is questioning uh, the amount, the billions and billions of euro that are put into those areas for making us competitive. We should do exactly the same with, with uh, storage. Okay. Is there anything just from the Commission side you wanted to add to this? <coughs> well, I think it's... Um, what Hans said, I think, is very, very wise. We all agree that we need storage because storage is an important component of the of the energy mix, in particular with regard to renewables. We need as well interconnection. It was just uh, pointed at the problem of uh, of Spain. I said in my introductory remarks that I I'm very happy that we have as well now an interconnection target because I think that's linked. We cannot just do the other targets without interconnection. Um, but I would as well think yes, it's important to do R and D. And we are rather rather prudent if we should have another intervention in the market for storage because we think we should first try to get the market conditions right and then the market should produce as much storage as needed and we shouldn't add one intervention too quickly into the market after the other. We should, say we should, we should call for some prudence. But we are very much aware of the fact that we need to bring more storage into the market. Okay, thank you. I'm just having a... We're kind of at the end. Uh, do we have that? Oh, there is a man there. In the second, where's the lady with the microphone? The gentleman with the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Johnston, uh, EPC. Um, Maciej, uh, on MSR, is, are there any circumstances in which Poland could vote for MSR? Uh, and if not, uh, if we note um, you will vote red, like you voted red last time on backloading, then the presidency can continue building a qualified majority in the usual way. And we can, once that's done, we can get on to the legislation for the 2030 package next summer. Um, so, yeah, first question again. Are there any circumstances in which Poland could vote for the MSR bill on the table? Thank you. So, I'm lucky enough to be energy attaché and not the environment attaché. <laughs> 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 so I'm not dealing with an MSR. So even if I wanted to give you our negotiating strategy, I cannot do it. <laughs> because I don't know that. Uh, and frankly, 
Um, as I said, we have a serious problem with MSR uh, because it's the intervention. Uh, and I see and I'm afraid that if the MSR doesn't reach the price level that is desired by some parts of the industry, uh, we would require another intervention mm -hmm. uh, because it will be uh, spoiled as uh, ETS is spoiled right now. So this is this is the the, the ground for for our uh, opposition to that, as well as the the, uh, the affordability issue. I think that the really important issue right now is that we are going even farther uh, in our discussions than the European Council conclusions tell us to do. Because the European Council conclusions ask us to, to introduce some kind of instrument uh, along with the pro Commission proposal. And I hear that uh, uh, it should be uh, introduced earlier even. And uh, that is moving the problem even farther. So I don't know really how to answer your question. I would say I can only indicate what problems we have uh, and I don't know what answer will be. Okay, you need to talk to his colleague in the environment. Okay, I'm going to park it there for a minute. I'm sure you've all got rumbling tummies and I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to make a last final flash statement, song, dance, poem, point <laughs> to these good folk before they're released for lunch. So, Mr. Commission. Mr. Commission is too much honour. Uh, I think um, the discussion has shown that there could be that there is quite some, some reason to be optimistic. We are at the beginning of a mandate. We have a vice president now for the energy union, which is a very interesting concept, which we will fill up with, with life and a lot of concrete actions in the next five years. We start with, I think it's very good, we start with an agreement of the heads of state on 2030, so we have a clear mandate now to, to implement that, which will as, uh, as well, together with the energy union, set a bit the tone for the next, next five years. So I think we, we are ready to, to start with a rather ambitious energy policy in the time in the time to come. And we are looking very much forward to work together with you, with the Luxembourgish Presidency, and with the different industry associations, and of course with our Polish colleagues. Okay, thank you. Guy. Uh, just, just what I said from the beginning, all will be about governance. An energy union will be about governance, about how we can streamline by country and national uh, policy, and then having a regional dimension. Okay, thank you. Hans? I would only repeat once more, it's crucial that we get the whole CO2 story correct. It's crucial that we don't pay only attention towards uh, uh, national binding targets or non-targets. Interconnectors are important. The other thing, how long are we staying around with messing with all kinds of national interventions on all kinds of generations? That will also be very decisive for the mix at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And there I would say, I don't see 194 changing overnight. But the regional cooperation will put quite some pressure on those member states which are going such a way which is not sustainable in the long term to change their mind. Uh, so I would plead at least to start off very quickly with regional corporations where uh, not only the renewables but also the total energy policy is coordinated. And let's see that we proceed in that direction. Good start, a lot of work to do. Okay, Thomas? Yes, uh, one, just one point. Um, I think what is happening in Ukraine now, to me, is one of the best arguments, one of the best arguments in favor of an energy union, mm -hmm. an energy union in which we do touch upon the sovereignty of member states. Mm -hmm. It is the best argument. So par parking that, I would like to say I very much agree with E about if this is supposed to become a success, it's about governance. Mm -hmm. It's all about governance. Mm -hmm. and, and how you install that will be decisive for whether we succeed or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maciej. I would say for the package, as I said in the beginning, the details will matter. And we will still have long discussions on the details, probably. Um, the energy union, I would say that the key word is solidarity in all dimensions. If we keep the solidarity on board, if we keep the three pillars of energy policy in balance, uh, then we will move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for coming here today and uh, for lending your brains and uh, your eloquence to the occasion and also for covering such a lot. It's great, it's just not enough time, an hour and a half, but thank you for all of those 
points of view and for making them so coherently and so concisely. Thanks very much to the audience. I took less questions this time. We seem to have quite a nice free-flowing debate, so I hope you did not get a chance to ask. Thank you for your patience, the gentleman on the front row. If you didn't get a chance to carpe diem and seize the day, then I think some of these guys, I hope, are staying around for lunch. You are certainly all invited, so do pounce on them in the middle of the the uh, entree and ask them those burning questions that you didn't have time or you were too shy to put your hand up. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, I hope to see you again at some point and have a very, very good afternoon. I wish you well. Bye -bye. You didn't get so fried, did you? No. You had lots of people in your corner. Don't be so good. Well, yeah, that's what I, that's what I sort of meant. It was just that. It was just that. First to say more of what normally it is. See you soon. Normally, I have to sort of say to people, leave him alone. Merci à vous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You have to tell them. You have to tell them. I know. And I'm 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 and I'm